Hello, good evening, and welcome back to the Rice and Allies studios. I'm Meher Sharma, Senior Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, and we're going to be talking for the next uh, 15 minutes or thereabouts on the subject of the Caucasus, and the South Caucasus in particular, an area which has seen a significant degree of instability in the past. Um, but we're going to be asking now, the, the uh, title of the session is Between Istanbul and Moscow, A Search for Stability. We're going to be asking a few questions about what the future of the region is. Um, will the region be increasingly forced to turn to Istanbul, for example, as its primary security provider? The government in Istanbul is um, quite dramatically populist in many ways. Um, Russia, meanwhile, is going through its own form of internal turbulence. We've just heard that the entire Russian government has presented its resignation to President Putin. And uh, the question is, is growth and stability for the countries in the region essentially dependent upon the relationship that Moscow and Istanbul have with each other, the relationship that Istanbul has with the rest of the world? And um, so these are the larger questions that we're going to try and figure out as we're going forward. Um, with me on the panel, we're very happy to have uh, uh, two people who are experts in the region. Um, Akko Gabrelian is a researcher at the Russian Armenian University in Russia, and Haj Khalatyan is a political analyst at Eurasia Daily in Armenia. I should tell you that, um, as opposed to most of our Facebook lives, we made a special um, exception for this particular studio panel. And uh, Mr. Khalatyan is not very comfortable speaking on these issues in English, so when he speaks, uh, Mr. Gabrelian would do some of the translation for him. Um, but I'm going to um, start by asking you, uh, sure. Mr. Gabrielian. Um, there's been a lot of news out of the region recently. Right. Um, most recently, a couple of days ago, um, the very powerful presidents and leaders of both uh, of Turkey and Russia met. And they said that they wanted to take their relationship, which had been built up in Syria, forward. And you know, in particular, Turkey wanted Russia to start thinking about cooperation in Libya as well. This is an expansion of their cooperation that would have thought would have been thought unthinkable just four or five years ago when it was quite tight. Um, what does this mean uh, more generally and for the, the Caucasus in particular? Well, thank you very much for your question. Before I start, uh, I would say that I, I will speak on behalf of myself um, as an independent researcher, so without any particular affiliation to any um, institution. Um, but Addressing your question, yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, it is our firm conviction that the region and the uh, entire international system of security, uh, they are going through some significant changes which are associated with the processes that are taking place in the Middle East, in other parts of the world, and of course, uh, which are related to some geopolitical change that we witness currently. Uh, when it comes to the uh, regional security, to the role of Russia, to the role of Turkey, we see that um, countries are more engaged into some regional processes. For example, there are new processes that are going on in Libya. Turkey wants to have some um, significant impact on um, that particular hemisphere as well. Um, there are some ongoing processes in Syria as well, where Turkey is engaged, obviously. Some 20, 25 years ago, one could ha hardly imagine that a country like Turkey could influence that much without any substantial agreement with the Security Council. But now the reality has changed, as we see. And the reality is as follows. We see that gradually the, the world, let's say, order moves from the west to the east. And that changes the entire system of the relationship amongst the countries. You see that Russia and Turkey are uh, broadening their cooperation in different spheres. They are cooperating uh, when it comes to Syria as well. They try to engage with Iran. They try to engage with some other regional actors. And obviously, that affects the South Caucasus and the countries of the South Caucasus as well. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to some uh, global challenges in many respects, uh, the countries of the South Caucasus are usually perceived not as uh, subjects of international relations, but more as objects. It is not, let's say, fully true, or it is partially uh, true, uh, because these countries are affiliated with some different integration blocks. But nevertheless, um, it is at least my firm conviction that 
it matters a lot uh, whether we try to integrate countries, small countries especially, of some problematic regions or we do not. If we do not try to integrate these countries and they are perceived as objects of international relations rather than subjects, of course it um, undermines the stability and predictability of the region. So it is exceptionally important to engage uh, the countries, doesn't matter the scale, doesn't matter the population, to engage all countries, all um, states into a fully fledged horizontal dialogue and to make sure that this dialogue is maintained as much as possible. Because this dialogue, this horizontal dialogue, is one of the key, um, let's say, um, elements that will secure success of the international system of stability and international uh, system of uh, cooperation as we know it today. So that would be my answer for your question. Thank you. So I think we get a clear sense that there is a, these are countries that seek a, um, greater integration in the world on their own terms right. rather than um, as being forced to do so by one of the other powers that has a role in the region. So let's talk uh, briefly about the alliances that are relevant. Turkey, as most of you watching will know, is a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance. It's NATO. Um, although, let's say, its relationship with other NATO members has been difficult in the recent past. Uh, the question really is, through Turkey or otherwise, does NATO have a role in the South Caucasus in stabilizing that? And perhaps Mr. Should I, should I yes, translate? Please do. Well, luckily for all of us, at least two persons know Russian in this <laughs> room. So. Um, the question is as follows. Uh, вопрос заключается в следующем. Мы знаем, что Турция является членом НАТО, и она активно вовлечена yeah. в геополитические процессы. Uh, как, по-твоему, вот, членство НАТО сопоставимо с ее текущим вовлечением в эти процессы? Uh, надо отметить, что в регионе Южного Кавказа, представителем которого я являюсь, две самые главные проблемы – это неурегулированные территориальные конфликты и два разных конкурирующих интеграционных вектора. So as my colleague states, there are two major problems in the region of the South Caucasus, unsettled territorial conflicts and different integration trajectories of countries of the South Caucasus. Одним из них является евроинтеграция, и здесь очень важная роль Турции как члена НАТО, а также страны, находящейся в таможенном союзе с ЕС. So as my colleague states, uh, one of these trajectories is obviously Euro integration for Turkey, because Turkey is a member of NATO and there is a, uh, there is, um, a customs union uh, between the European Union and Turkey. Но при этом влиянию Турции в регионе, ее политике, очень сильно мешают исторические проблемы, в частности с Арменией. But at the same time, Turkey's role and influence in the region are undermined by her historically um, uh, historically um, set of problems with Armenia. И на этом фоне получается, что у Турции очень хорошие отношения с двумя странами региона, а с третьей страной Арменией mm -hmm. у нее нет не дипломатического отношения, и это единственная закрытая граница в Европе. So as Mr. Halatian states, uh, in that respect, it seems that Turkey has very good relationship with at least two countries of the South Caucasus, but with Armenia, it has barely any diplomatic relationship and close borders. And there is no such country in Europe in that respect. This is a valid point. I think that uh, the question of sort of the, Tur the European integration of uh, Turkey is one that I think has become an issue not just in the South Caucasus but in Europe itself. And there are many ways in which I, uh, the process does not seem to be moving at quite the pace we might have expected 20 years ago. Um, another of the sort of relevant powers of the region and one that, again, we have no clear idea of the future trajectory of is Iran. Could you little, tell us a little bit about how Iran plays a role in, in this region? Uh, У Ирана очень важная роль. Это один из, наряду с Турцией, двух региональных игроков, которые борются на, вли на влияние в регионе. Остальные – это глобальные – Россия, США, Европа. So, as Mr. Halatian uh, states, affirms, 
Iran plays a very important role in the region because Iran is one of two regional powers, like Turkey, because other powers are great powers who compete for the region. И надо помнить, что, например, для Армении это одна из двух границ, наряду с Грузией, которые есть у Армении открытые. А в Азербайджане, если отношения Иран-Азербайджан, надо помнить, что в Иране живут несколько раз больше азербайджанцев, чем в самом Азербайджане. And as Mr. Halatian affirms, it is important to remember that uh, it is just one of the borders that remains open for Armenia, the border with Iran. Uh, at the same time, having said that, many Azerbaijanis live in Iran, uh, especially uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the north of Iran. И поэтому для Армении и Азербайджана очень важно, чтобы ситуация с Ираном была урегулирована, потому что любой конфликт с Ираном – это поток беженцев, это закрытые границы и это очень серьезные политические проблемы для двух стран, экономические и политические. And as Mr. Halatian argues uh, for Armenia, it is exceptionally important that the conflict, the situation with Iran is settled, because if this situation goes spill o- spills over, of course it brings some additional questions of migrants, uh, huge flows of migrants into uh, the neighboring countries like Armenia and Azerbaijan. И не случайно, что даже две страны, находящиеся в конфликте, Армения и Азербайджан, в вопросе Ирана очень солидарную политику проводят, и оба подчеркивают, что они не будут участвовать в каких-либо враждебных шагах против Ирана и не будут прекращать сотрудничество с Ираном. And Mr. Halatian stresses that it is not an occasion actually that uh, even such countries as Armenia and Azerbaijan who have very difficult uh, diplomatic relationship, in fact they do not have diplomatic relationship, uh, in case of the question of Iran, they stress that they will not be involved in any anti-Iran policies because obviously they understand the consequences of this policy for themselves. So it is in, in many ways Iran, because of the Turkish attitude, currently is Armenia's lifeline uh, in terms of uh, borders, in terms of trade. And so it cannot be, uh, it has to be taken into account. A final sort of question essentially, and this is about Armenia in particular, and maybe you can take it, uh, Mr. Gabrielian. In 2013, um, Armenia essentially decided not to go ahead with the EU association agreement. I think many people might be surprised by that. Um, Could you explain a little bit more about whether the situation has changed and what the future for Armenia in, in Europe is? Sure, this is a very interesting question because on the one hand, we can state that the situation did change. Um, especially after the Velvet Revolution that occurred uh, in Mm. 2018. Uh, Many countries, including in Europe, perceived this revolution as a democratic change towards democracy, transparency, uh, broader cooperation with um, the European countries. At the same time, as Armenia always stated, it tries uh, at international level position itself as a country with versatile approach. So it um, does not, um, in a positive sense, does not differentiate between partners. It does not differentiate between countries who are interested in building cooperation with Armenia. When it comes particularly to the European Union, we must um, clearly understand that the European Union plays a vital role in the region. And uh, for Armenia particularly, uh, it is one of the main trading partners of Armenia. Of course, as you mentioned, there was some negotiation concerning uh, Armenia's accession um, concerning Armenia's involvement to the uh, association agreement. Uh, Now, instead of association agreement, there is this famous uh, SEPA agreement, a comprehensive economic partnership, uh, which also presumes a wide scope of uh, benefits and uh, cooperation perspective for the country. And as a matter of fact, the Armenian parliament already ratified that agreement. the EU member states, um, they also ratify this, um, this agreement. If I'm not mistaken, only eight states remain that uh, should ratify the agreement in 2020, but uh, that's just a matter of time. So we expect that this cooperation with Europe will, uh, will continue. It will encompass more, um, uh, more realms. Mm-hmm. It will, yes, encompass more sectors. And uh, eventually it will bring uh, more, um, more uh, financial as well as um, uh, vocational aid uh, to the South Caucasian Republic. Thank you. And I think that it is interesting from the point of view of the outside world that if they were t- to ask which area is more likely uh, to fit in with the European values at this point in time, I think um, Armenia is definitely high on that list. 
um, as compared to maybe other countries that were earlier on, on an accession route. Um, I just finally want to sort of ask, and a very short answer maybe from both of you. In your opinion, is there an outside role, power, situation, somebody who can stabilize the region? Есть ли, по вашему мнению, некий актор, в том числе и актор извне, который мог бы стабилизировать регион? Скажем, многие эксперты считают, что ну, история показывает, скорее так, история показывает, что мир на Южном Кавказе был тогда, когда была одна держава, одна или две державы, которые сверху как бы устанавливали мир в регионе, учитывая сложные отношения между странами, народами и регионом. So, as Mr. Halatan states, as history evidences, uh, peace happened, occurred in the region of the South Caucasus when there were one or two great powers establishing, um, establishing peace in the region. So, either the Tsarist Russia or the, yeah, Turkey, or the Iran. Or, yeah. Но, скажи, хочется надеяться, что в 21 веке страны региона все-таки найдут способность сами решать проблемы, свои проблемы, без того, чтобы кто-то сверху, как то, как эта сильная страна, сверху их заставила решить эти проблемы. As Mr. Halatian concludes, uh, there is some hope that at least in the 21st century the countries of the region will find power to, um, you know, achieve peaceful solution, peaceful um, future without any foreign interference. И скажи, ладно, продолжи. Я хочу свою мысль сказать, но продолжи. И Хочется надеяться, что регион станет местом, где интересы глобальных и региональных игроков сопоставляются, а не регионом, где они вступают в конфликт с друг другом. So, and as uh, he states, uh, there is some hope that the region will become a region where the interests of great global powers will um, cope, but not compete against each other. From my side, I will conclude that... Um, in, it is my, again, firm conviction, and in my eyes, the peace to the region can be brought only with, the, uh, with an understanding that uh, the instruments to um, initiate and to implement this peace cannot be found somewhere else, but, to, but in the capitals of the republics of the South Caucasus. So instead of trying to accuse and blame some other sides, instead of trying to put the responsibility on the shoulders of third sides, it is the best approach to... Um, address this question directly and to find the solution by uh, the joint efforts of the countries of the region. Thank you, and I think that's a wonderful spot, uh, tone on which to end. And uh, thank you both for coming, and thank you for watching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.